looking at, for those that are just joining now, we're looking at 1 Samuel 18, and we're looking at Psalm 1. So, Psalm 1, and 1 Samuel 18. Now, just to remind everybody what we're doing, we've been studying a series on Wednesday nights called the Songs of Life. And the idea is we're looking at different psalms, and we're relating those psalms to our study of the life of David. So each Sunday morning, <clears throat> we study a portion of the life of David. Um, we're up to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and then on Wednesdays, we try to take a psalm that relates to what we study. So some of the psalms have been really easy to do that. Others of the psalms, other points in David's life, we don't have a psalm that exactly corresponds with it, so I try to find one that relates. So the, the choice tonight is going to be Psalm 1, and Psalm 1, and the title of the lesson I'm going with tonight is A Song of Satisfaction, A Song of Satisfaction. So in your Bibles, look with me at Psalm chapter 1, and we'll begin verse number 1. Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper." The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. If you would just notice again the opening statement of Psalm 1, and it's really where I'm getting the title, uh, A Song of Satisfaction. It's in that statement, verse number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. You'll then also see in verse number 2 that the statement, his delight is in the law of the Lord. So if you notice in verse number 1, the blessed man. Verse number 2, he's a, he's a person who delights. And then you see in verse number 3 that he's someone that is like a tree planted by rivers of water. Um, at the end of the verse talks about this person prospering. So we want to talk tonight about what the scripture says about how you and I can have meaning in our life in the sense of satisfaction, fulfillment, and really this word blessedness. So let's have a word of prayer together and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper. Dear God, we are grateful that we can study the Bible together tonight. I'm so thankful for all the folks that have joined me here and I pray that this would be a, a meaningful time. I pray, Lord, that um, you would help the truth of the scripture to grip our hearts. And Lord, I pray that it would encourage us. Lord, I know that this passage is an encouragement to me. And I just sense that uh, probably many need encouragement tonight. And we're going through different difficulties and struggles. And I just pray that we would turn our eyes to you. I pray that uh, we would be fed and ministered to by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. And, and once again, we're just thankful that we have this time in the middle of our week to come together as church and as friends and uh, fellow Christians and study the Bible together. So we pray that um, all that we do and say tonight and that this study would bring honor and glory to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, again, thanks for joining. And we are, a couple have just jumped on, I noticed, after we prayed. So we're in Psalm 1, and we're also going to briefly look at 1 Samuel 18, we're talking about the song of satisfaction. And that comes from that word blessed in verse number one. So Psalm 1-1, blessed is the man. So blessed is a word that is full of just um, spiritual meaning. And it's all over the New Testament and the Old Testament. The idea of blessing or being blessed or receiving a blessing. And so when you study that word, and it's obviously it's a Hebrew word, but when you study it and you understand exactly what it means. In its simplest sense, the word blessed means to be happy. That's what it literally means. It speaks of a happiness. 
But in, when you study it in its context, you find that it's not just a temporary happiness, but blessing is the kind of happiness that only comes from God. And so I think if we, if we were to understand it as a sense of deep satisfaction and fulfillment in our lives, that's what this psalm is talking about. This psalm is a, a, a song explaining how a person can really experience a happy life. Not a perfect life, not a life without problems and difficulties, but a life that is marked by the blessing of God, by uh, the hand of God in a person's life. Now, there's a couple of simple principles that I want to show you, and you might be wondering, if you've been paying attention to the Sunday morning series, you might be wondering, how does this passage relate? Well, really, it relates in the first point, and that is this. Point number one, uh, and there's several things, several principles in this passage to how we can find satisfaction in life. But the first thing I want us to see tonight from Psalm 1 is this, that true satisfaction, the true blessing of God, one of the sources of that is um, satisfaction will come through spiritually healthy relationships. Okay? Mark that down. Spiritually healthy relationships. Notice what the psalmist says here right off the bat. If you want to be a blessed person, if you want to be the blessed man or the blessed woman, you want to experience this satisfaction that comes from God, you've got to decide who you're going to spend your time with. You've got to decide how, uh, what kind of relationships will my life consist of. You know, in a lot of ways, the quality of our life can be described by the company that we choose to keep. And that is actually a spiritual principle. If you take your Bible back to 1 Samuel 18, and we notice the passage that we looked at on Sunday, you'll see, uh, look at verse number 1 of 1 Samuel 18. It talks about David, and it says, It came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. So if you remember on Sunday, we emphasized this idea of Christian friendship, of Christian relationships, of the blessing that comes from God's people loving one another and living in fellowship one with another. Well, David's life is actually going to be marked by all kinds of relationships. David is going to have a lot of healthy relationships in his life. He's going to have some toxic relationships in his life. And all of us have experienced both extremes. We've had uh, friendships and, and people in our lives that have really built into us and have been really... I mean, there are numbers of people in my life, both in my family and in the family of faith, and even outside of that, just people that God has brought into my life that have been a huge encouragement to me. And, and they are the blessing of God in my life. Well, back to Psalm 1, that's one of the principles that the scriptures point out. That there are many people that are not experiencing a blessing in their life because they are not pursuing healthy spiritual relationships. You know, there's really two types of friends. There are people that need you to be a friend to them. Sometimes they're not the most spiritual people. Sometimes they're people that are struggling, but they need godly people, followers of Christ, to invest in them. But then you and I also need friendships that are investing and building into us. Now notice, for instance, the specific counsel that's given here about what healthy relationships are and what they are not. He says here, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. He says, first of all, if you're going to have healthy relationships, they're not relationships uh, with people who give you ungodly counsel. Secondly, he says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. If you're going to be blessed, if you're going to have satisfaction, you're not going to be around people that give you ungodly counsel. You're not going to be, uh, first he says, walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Then he says, not standing in the way of sinners. And then he says, not sitting in the seat of the scornful. And so you notice the descriptive words, walking, standing, sitting. And a lot of Bible teachers have always pointed out that progression. You know, you begin walking with people, then you're, it slows down and you're standing with them, and eventually you're, you find yourself sitting with them. And I don't think that's a bad application. I think that principle is there. But what I want to see here, though, is healthy spiritual relationships 
um, are not those with people who, first of all, would give you bad advice. You see what he says here? The man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We need to be careful about the advice that we listen to. There are no shortage of people that want to get, um, give counsel into our lives and tell us what kind of decisions that we should make. Well, whenever I'm trying to make a decision, I'm looking for godly counsel. I'm looking for people that are going to help me make a spiritual decision. But I've also got to consider that not every person, not every article, not every book, not every, even if it's a Christian book or Christian person, not every bit of counsel is going to be spiritually healthy in my life. So if I'm going to have healthy spiritual relationships that result in satisfaction in my life, I've got to be careful that I'm not taking bad advice. I'm looking at the, I'm considering the source of the information I'm receiving. What does their life look like? Are they devoted followers of Christ? Before I, before I listen to their advice on how I should raise my children, before I, should listen, before I listen to their advice on how I should spend my money, I want to know, is this someone whose life exemplifies Christ? Are they an example of Christ in their own life? If not, that's not somebody that's going to be building into me. And the psalm here teaches us, you need to watch out for that. You need healthy relationships. Those who will give you godly counsel, so not bad advice. But not only do we see here that, the, that spiritually healthy relationships avoid bad advice, but they also avoid, avoid bad behavior. He says here, that this person won't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, that's bad advice, but they also are not going to associate with bad behavior. He says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. There is a danger in spending our recreation time, our free time, around activities that we know don't bring honor to the Lord. It has, a, it has the effect of bringing us down. And there are people that they don't experience the fullness, the blessing, the happiness that God designed for our lives. And a lot of it has to do with the people that they surround themselves with. People that are either giving them bad advice or bringing bad behaviors into their life. And I know that that sounds a little bit simplistic, almost like we're talking to children or talking to, to young people. But sometimes... You and I just need the simple, clear advice and teaching from the Word of God that says, do you want God's blessing in your life? Do you want happiness? Listen, watch out for who's giving you advice and be careful what kind of activities the people around you are, are bringing you into. And I think that's, that's, good, that's good counsel for both the young and the old. And then finally, in this, uh, in this theme here of spiritually healthy relationships, not only do we have to watch out for bad advice and bad behavior, but how about this? Just people with some bad attitudes. Look at verse number um, look at verse number one again. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Not only are there attitudes and not only are there behaviors and counsel that are going to negatively affect us spiritually, but there are also just attitudes. There are spirits. There are um, just the, the general um, way in which a person carries themselves that, that can be used of the enemy to discourage believers. I think of just sometimes the um, overly negative attitudes or attitudes that can uh, cause us to doubt God's word or um, attitudes of scorn or attitudes of envy or or gossip or those kinds of things and so he says here listen are you experiencing satisfaction in your life one of the things you've got to ask yourself if the answer is no one of the things you got to ask yourself is well who am i hanging around who am i spending time with what do the relationships in my life look like and i think a good lesson for us as a church is listen as um as church as a church grows and as people come to faith they need good Christian friends. They need a good Christian family of faith to build into them. So on the one hand, we ought to be seeking those kind of friendships. But on the other hand, we ought to be looking for who we can invest in spiritually uh, to help see them grow in Christ and experience uh, that blessing of their walk with God. 
So, the first thing we see here, this song of satisfaction. A blessed man, a blessed woman, is somebody who has found spiritually healthy relationships. But now we move into verse number two, and we find that satisfaction, secondly, comes from the Word of God. It comes from the Word of God. Look at verse two. So this person has right relationships in verse number one, but now verse number two, look at what brings him joy. Look at what brings him happiness. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. When we talk about the law of the Lord, people automatically think of words like legalism and say, oh, well, you know, Christians and um, conservative Christians, you're all about, you know, the law and obedience and legalism, and that can be soul-crushing. Well, of course, if it's not understood properly or if it's misapplied, yeah, it can have that effect. But the truth is here, the psalmist says he delights in God's law. He would look at, um, he would look at God's commandments. And remember, when the writer of the psalm here is penning these words, he doesn't even have the New Testament. The Psalms aren't even written. But he's simply got the law of the Lord. He's got the, uh, the passages, that yes, like the Ten Commandments, but also the passages that say uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Um, he, they've got all of those truths. And he says, listen, the law of God isn't a burden to me. It's actually one of the great delights in my life. It's one of the great joys of my life. And that is, that is something that we experience as Christians, as believers, we understand that every command that God has given us, every principle in this book, every truth, uh, both the positive and the negative commandments are all given for our benefit. So when God tells us to actively do something uh, in obedience, or he tells us negatively to avoid something, he's doing it for our good and for his glory. And when we understand that, when we understand that all of God's command, all of God's law, all of God's truth is not for, is not to keep men and women down and repressed, but it's actually to give us true freedom. When we understand that and God's love and intention for us in his law, then it becomes a great delight to us. We study it. We meditate on it. It's really probably a lot of the reason, hopefully you are here tonight, not just because you see it as your duty as a, as a church member or as a Christian to, uh, to take part in the Bible study. But hopefully the Word of God, you have found it to be a delight to your soul. And you know that when you're away from the Word of God, that your soul suffers. But when you're in the Word of God and you're studying the Bible, you know that it feeds your soul. I know sometimes for me, if I'm going through difficulty or struggle, I, I could hear a message or read something in the Bible and it might not even directly relate to what I'm going through, but just hearing the Word of God and just studying the Bible, God's Holy Spirit ministers to my heart. And I'm sure He does for you as well. And so this, this writer here, this psalmist, is singing this song, and he's just talking about how wonderful his life is. He's saying, I've got a blessed life. Why? Because I have wonderful spiritual relationships Secondly, because I just love the Word of God. I have God's Word. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. So thirdly now, we see that satisfaction also comes, blessing, happiness, this joy, this inner peace. It comes from, thirdly, spiritual fruitfulness. Spiritual fruitfulness. So first of all, remember, healthy relationships, Secondly, a love for the Word of God. And now thirdly, in verse number three, spiritual fruitfulness or productivity. Look at verse three. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Old Testament is filled with beautiful word pictures. And here we're introduced to a peaceful riverside and a beautiful tree. And we live in an area... Um, those of you that are watching that are local, we live, we live in a beautiful area here in the Berkshires with rivers and, and, and so much vegetation. And I think of the Hoosick River and the, the, and where I live, I can take a walk down to the river and see uh, just all the, all the vegetation and the trees and the beauty that grows along the river. And that's really the picture that's given here. This person, uh, this individual who's living a blessed life, they, they say, I just feel like a, like a healthy tree that's just growing and thriving 
Why? For one thing, it's because I'm planted. I'm planted in the right place. I'm being fed by the Word of God and by good people around me. And because of that, because I'm planted and because I'm growing, this tree is going to bring forth fruit in his season. He says, I'm like a tree that's just, it's, it's not me producing the fruit. There's no tree in and of itself that can do it. But if the tree is planted in the right conditions and it's being fed the right nutrients, then it's just going to produce fruit. And you and I are the same way as believers. If we know Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives. So the Holy, we, don't, we don't produce the fruit, but as we stay in the Word of God, and as we stay abiding in the vine as Jesus described, He produces fruit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit, things like love, joy, peace, and the whole list of the fruit of the Spirit, and how the, um, our lives begin to change, not because of our own effort, but because of our relationship to the Lord. It says here that he's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Sometimes I feel like I'm starting to wither up a little bit. And that's when I need to be reminded that I need a fresh infusion of the water of the Word of God, of the nutrients of God's Word. I may need, uh, like we saw in verse 2, like I just said, the Word of God to minister to me, or I may need the blessing of God's people to minister to me. But when I have godly people in my life, when I have the Word of God in my life, God is going to produce fruitfulness. And as I see those results, I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be happy. It's going to be, that is going to be the result. So, we see these three principles for living a, uh, a truly satisfied life. Healthy spiritual relationships, a love for the Word of God, and then seeing His fruit produced in my life. But now He shifts, and He says, you've got a choice. Your life can either be described as this blessed and satisfied life, or you can do it on your own terms. You can live your, your life on your own terms. And you can live a life apart from God. Well, that is described as the ungodly life. Look at verse number four. The ungodly are not so. Not, not what? They're not blessed. They're not happy. They're not satisfied. The ungodly are not so. But rather than being described as a, um, as a fruitful tree, they are described like chaff that the wind drives away. They would, they would harvest the wheat in the harvest season, and they would separate the wheat from the chaff, and then they would just, uh, and you could still do this with, you could do this today, you could try it, you could take wheat, and they would um, wring out the, 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 um, the grain from that wheat, and then whatever's left over, the, the husk that's left, they just throw it up, and the wind would carry it away. So that word picture there is, on the one hand, you've got a blessed person who walks with God, and in their life, they're like a solid tree by the water, just growing and thriving. Or you could choose to live life on your own terms, but then you're going to be more like that wisp of, a wisp of husk that just blows away. Nothing rooted, nothing anchored. And really, it's one of the sad statements of our generation today is that so many people's lives are... They just seem so unanchored, so unrooted, changing from this situation to that, and relational turmoil, and all of these struggles that people have. And I believe that, that well, we know much of it is because people choose to live their lives on their terms. We're, as human beings, we're self-destructive. We think, well, if I live God's way, that will make me miserable. I'll live my way. So if you're watching this and you're, we're studying this passage together and you say, and you've been, had that attitude, you know, I don't want to do it God's way. I want to live my way. I want to live on my terms. If that's been your attitude, I just have to ask you, how's that working out for you? How's it working out living life on your own terms? Because I can bear witness and give testimony that I'm thrilled to be living my life according to God's plan. And I'm not perfect. And, and you're not perfect. None of us are. But my life is anchored in the truth of God's word, 
And even when I fall short of God's expectation for me, I'm always confident of His love and of His plan. And I tell you what, that gives such a sense of satisfaction. So I echo the song, I sing the song with the psalmist to say, I'm living the satisfied life, the blessed life. But the ungodly are not so, they're like the chaff that the wind drives away. Verse 5, because of this, therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Whoa, now it's ratcheted up a little bit. We've gone from talking about satisfaction in this life here and now to eternal consequences for living life on our own terms. He talks about the judgment. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. And we need to be reminded that there is a judgment day. There is a day where every person will stand before God. And I would hate to stand, I would hate to have to stand before him and say, I rejected your plan for my life and I chose my own plan. One of the saddest things in the world would be for somebody to go through their whole life never experiencing satisfaction here and now, but then also going into eternity lost and guilty at the judgment. We need to be reminded that there is a judgment. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But verse number six, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Can I finish tonight by just describing the way of the righteous? Jesus actually told us what it, what it is. If we're talking about true satisfaction both here and now and for all of eternity, we've got to understand what is the way of the righteous? Is the way of the righteous um, prescribed in some religious formula? Is it attained through some church or through some code of behavior? Because surely we've talked about some of those things. We've talked about the practical aspects of choices we make and decisions and how we live. But really, as you think about the way of the righteous, you need to be reminded of what Jesus said. In John chapter 14, Jesus said this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You, say, the, you see, the way of the righteous and the way to satisfaction begins and ends with Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. The psalmist said, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to get to the Father, the only way, Jesus said, is to come by me. And he is the ultimate door to satisfaction. So as you think about that, understand, understand it this way. When the Bible is about the way of the righteous, of course there are, some, there are behaviors of right and wrong that are associated with that. But it all begins and flows out of a relationship with Christ. Christianity is not so much what we do as who we are in Christ. What we do flows, or the way of our righteousness, flows out of the righteousness of Christ. So it all begins with having that personal relationship with Jesus, where you come to the point in your life where you understand that you are a sinner, you are ungodly, as this, as this psalmist said, that, that you're, you and I at one point, we were those people that said, no, I don't care about your blessing, God, I'm just going to live my way. But when we realize that error, when we realize that we are in danger of the judgment, then we see Christ, who came and lived the perfect way. He lived out the perfect righteousness, but gave his life on the cross, died for our sins, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Jesus died to make the way for us to come to God. And the Bible says that anyone any person who believe in Jesus, put their full faith and trust in Him. Any person who make that decision to repent of their sin and put their faith in Christ, anyone can be saved. You can, wherever you are right now, you can do that. In your heart, you can tell God that you know you've sinned, but you believe He died and rose for you, and you can ask Him to save you. And then what happens is, He leads us in the paths of righteousness. He begins to introduce to us 
the way of satisfaction. And then he'll give us commands to follow. He'll give us truths to obey. He'll give us a path to walk in. But that's after we put our faith and trust in him first. So, you're one of two people here tonight. You are possibly the person who's living life your own way. You are in danger of God's judgment. You need to repent. You need to call out to Christ to save you by faith alone. If you'll do that, you can be assured of your salvation and you can be assured of your relationship with Christ. Or you could be a second group of people. And you could be the person that knows Christ. You've been saved. You're a believer. You've trusted in Jesus. And you have experienced the blessing that comes through following him. But maybe, even though you know you're his, you know you belong to him, maybe the old behaviors have crept back in. Maybe some of the old um, attitudes have crept back in. Maybe your love for the Word of God has gotten cold. And you're realizing, I experienced the blessing in my life once, but it's been a while since I've experienced it. So I would encourage you to just return to the cross tonight. Return to what Jesus has done for you. Be assured of His love for you. And realize that any step He asks you to take in obedience is only for your good, for His glory. And so we surrender that to him tonight. So whatever your need is, whether you need to put your faith in Christ for the first time, or as a Christian, maybe you need to just rededicate and repurpose the next days ahead to say, Lord, I am going to live for your glory because I know by obeying you and following you, I'll experience that satisfaction. Why don't we pray together and, and whichever person you are, spend time with the Lord tonight as we, as we close in prayer. God, I thank you so much for how you speak to us through your word. Lord, I thank you that we can be assured of your love for us and your plan for us. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody tonight that's never put their trust in you as their Savior, Lord, I pray they'd make that decision. I pray that they would stop trying to earn heaven or live their life on their own terms. I pray that they would call out to you to save them. And then, God, I pray for Christians like me tonight who, Lord, we wander and we struggle sometimes. We miss out on the blessing you have for us. I pray that you give us the faith to follow you. I pray that you would um, help us to overcome our fears of the negative influences in our lives. And, Lord, just be fully committed to your plan and your will for us. Once again, we thank you for the word of God. Help us to love it and learn it. I pray for our church tonight. I pray for those that, are, uh, that need healing. I pray that you would uh, give them that physical healing that they need. I pray for those who are discouraged, that you would encourage them, lift them up. I pray for those who may have financial needs, God, that you would meet those needs. Lord, I, uh, I pray for our church family that are, are grieving the loss of loved ones, both in our church and through Uh, the extension of our missionary family, Lord. I just pray that you would comfort those that need your comfort. Lord, we thank you for um, this country. We pray that you'd bless our leadership. We pray that you would um, guide our uh, elected officials. Lord, I just pray that um, you would just help us in, in our community to reach others, to be a light. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you to everybody who stuck with me to the end tonight. It's been really good to to have this time together. Thank you for being here. And I see some of you left comments as I was going on that you're watching. So that was an encouragement. All right. Well, we will have uh, updates uh, probably by Friday as as to uh, this Sunday services and what the plans are. But either way, whether in person or online, we will uh, meet together this Sunday and uh, spend time again in the Word of God and in worship. So if you have a special prayer request, please send it to me. Uh, Anything that uh, you'd like us to be praying for. um, And just let me know. Some people have shared prayer requests uh, the last few days. They say they don't want to be public prayer requests, and that's fine. If you share something, just let me know if uh, you want us to let others know to be praying for you, or you'd just like like me to be praying. I'd be happy to to pray for you. Um, And I'd encourage you to take some time after we end tonight to... uh, 
Wednesday's our prayer meeting night, so in your home with your family, just take a few minutes and, uh, and spend time in prayer for our church, uh, for one another, and, um, and for, the, for those needs. So again, thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Good night, everybody.